coming today to this um, talk by the, or arranged by the Center for Digital Play. I'm enormously happy that this talk finally happens. We've had to move it several times, and, um, and finally it's going to happen, and I think you're in for a treat. Uh, I'm so happy to have as a uh, guest today, Helena Sokal, who's a game producer at Splashball. Now I got it right. <laughs> uh, so, as you probably have heard, there's a number of things going on in the Danish games industry uh, for the last year or so. Um, we got in new initiatives and new structures and all kinds of um, events happening. And we like to think and talk about it, and we like to uh, open up our rooms for discussing about these things. And I cannot imagine having a better person to discuss this than Helena, for two reasons. So the first one is that uh, Helena wrote her master thesis actually studying the games industry, which is a radical concept for many people, going and asking game producers <coughs> and game developers how their games are produced, made, funded, run, and she probably wrote the first comprehensive understanding of the Danish games industry as an industry uh, that I know. Uh, and after that, you jump ship from the academic world to the producer world, and that's the second reason why Helena is a voice we need to listen to, because she is a game producer. So her knowledge about how games are made, funded, and distributed is also knowledge on the ground how these things actually happen, how you have to deal with people, with publishers, with the whole political environment. And there's even a third reason, and that is she's uh, a founder of the Game Producers Network, uh, an um, interest organization here in uh, Denmark for game producers. So I am extremely happy that we are going to have uh, the opportunity to listen to you, so I look forward to, to this talk. Thank you so much. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so welcome everybody, um, and my presentation is called Back in the Right Horse because I am looking at the political tools that we can use for game industry growth. So we're going to unpack and sort of perspectivize these political tools that we have here in Denmark and in the EU as an overall um, area. So who am I? Uh, Miguel just uh, did a wonderful introduction of me. Um, I have, before I went into the game industry, I had 10 years in arts management where I uh, helped galleries, um, coordinate events and curate, and I helped artists uh, run their studios. And then I went to CBS, uh, got a master of uh, management of creative business processes. It's a long title with lots of fluffiness. <laughs> um, but I did, uh, after a while, uh, wrote, write my uh, master thesis on an ecosystem analysis of the game industry uh, here in Denmark. And now I've been in the game industry for three years, and I'm at, at Plashball Games right now. Um, so today's agenda is threefold. We've got um, a very sort of like Slavic going through the tools that we have. So we're gonna define the tools, we're gonna figure out what are we working with when we talk about political tools. There, uh, after we're going to go into a short history of game initiatives in Denmark, and we're gonna sort of have a small comparison to the Nordics because our histories uh, have unfolded differently in our like these Nordic countries. And what has, what can we learn from that? And lastly, we're going to talk about the changing political landscape and future challenges for the Danish industry. And why is this interesting <laughs> at all? Um, well, I think that policy and government, it inter its interference can imp impact all aspects of the game industry. How we enter it, to how we distribute games, to what content we can put in games, um, and how we become successful. To some extent, it really dictates you know, how people interact with our games. Um, and in this sense, I think that policy and the tools provided are a requirement for us to work with when we talk about how we wanna grow a sustainable um, games industry. Mm. 
And up here, I've divided it into skills, access, and people, because one of the things that policy can do is that it can create a foundation for people to figure out how they want to run their business to how we actually um, found companies and how we make sure that we, ha we can market our games. Access to capital um, and access to figuring out whether we should go the cultural or commercial way in, in terms of our games is also dictated to some extent by, um, by the policies that we have in place already. And lastly, policy and regulations also affect people, how we attract talent to Denmark, how we educate people in the country as well. So we're gonna go first uh, into defining the tools, what we're working with. And here we have two, I, di I divided them up in two uh, types of political instrument. These are not only specific for the game industry, they can also exist in other industries. But we do, or Europe has specific uh, types of political instruments for game industry. <coughs> so we have the direct, the direct uh, political tools that we have, I've divided into subsidies and funding because subsidies are non-repayable grants. So that means that you don't have to pay them back once you get them. Funding is pretty self-explanatory, but there's two types, you know, we have match funding and we have seed funding and loans. And these are repayable, so you need to pay them back after you get them. Um, <coughs> indirect po uh, political tools also has a type called subsidies, but these subsidies are tax credits and other tax incentives. Then we have incubators and accelerator programs, as well as overall regulations and policies on an EU level, which also impact um, what we can trade, what we can have content in our games, how we deal with intellectual property and so forth. Um, here we have the direct political tools, the non-repayable, um, what's it called, tool is usually what we have, what we call cultural support. In Denmark, this means that it's spillordning and over, yeah, I think 10 different countries in Europe has different kinds of cultural support um, in, some, in some aspects. And um, one of the, the big conditions for cultural support is that you have to go through an application to sort of prove that you and your game um, fulfill a certain amount of requirements. So that can be cultural, historical, you know, it can depend on what, like where are your artists from. Usually there's a language requirement. So, you know, if you need spillotning, you will need to make your uh, game in Danish so that it can be distributed in Denmark. Um, cultural support, an important part of this is that it's bound by the Minimis EU directive. And that means that this, um, this rule allow exemptions from state aid controls for small aid amounts, up to 200,000 euros to, um, to be given out without any kind of, yeah, uh, basically rules uh, where you, because they have been deemed to not have an impact on competition overall. So the state can give out 200,000 euros per year to, you know, without impacting competition. So you're not in direct competition with anybody else. Um, <coughs> match funding and loans are not, in Denmark, specific to games. There are some countries that have specific uh, loans for game companies or specific um, loans for small, medium uh, enterprises. Um, and match funding is basically the process of the state going like, you have an investor, we can match what they give, but you have to find the investor. Um, lastly, we have the stage dependent production support, which <coughs> the purpose of this is to support, you know, game, game studios in the phases that they needed the most. So usually you have, you know, when you start up a game studio, you're gonna have to need, or you're gonna need seed funding um, when you grow you can get investing or f uh, funding from investors. And you also have something called prototype um, funding. And prototype funding is not something that has 
that we have here in Denmark yet, but it's something that more and more European uh, countries are aiming to have because it's a specific stage at a game studio's life where it's extra risky for them. And actually, most of the prototype funding is usually non-repayable grants. And thereby also, it also is subject to the same kind of application um, process that cultural support is. So you have to go through a specific set of conditions um, where sometimes it's cultural and sometimes it has to do with how you set your business up. Um, match funding, the Danish equivalent of this is Eiffel or VIX funding which was previously, uh, previously named like that. Um, it hasn't been easy for Danish game companies to get VIX Fund on board, mostly because of missing knowledge within VIX Fund on how the cultural and creative industries in general work. Um, a third or a fourth um, direct political tool could be said to be co-productions, it's very uh, often set in, uh, or af often used in film. So the process there goes like, they find a director or a light crew or some other employees in another country so that they can say to the, that national cultural fund, say like, we have some people from your country, we have people in Denmark, we can get money from both countries. This is sort of a unused, process uh, for the game industry as far as I know. Um, it's also much more complex if you were to control um, a production from several places and you would most likely have to fill a lot of conditions to, um, to get that kind of funding. So <laughs> we're not gonna talk a lot about if this is correct or this is wrong um, that we have cultural uh, support for the game industry. These are some of the arguments in two extremist political philosophies that you can hear when you talk about cultural funding. So on one side, we have the more libertarian um, political yeah, philosophy where they say like, oh, um, the government and entrepreneurs, they work at different paces. And I would say all of these are technically correct on both sides because the government works really slowly and entrepreneurs need to work really fast. So when they try to you know, match up their, their pace, everybody loses. <laughs> um, subsidy entrepreneurs are less productive. This is, a, this is an academic uh, theory where subsidy entrepreneurs are people who focus on getting uh, non-repayable grants all the time. So they, they, they spend a lot of their time writing applications and they get really good at it, but they're also less productive in the sense that they don't work or produce as much as uh, entrepreneurs in general. Companies must be at least several years old and successful to have a serious impact on job creation. This is something that's very, it's, it's uh, illustrated in the Danish game industry as well. We've got loads, we've got a lot of smaller companies with between one to five people, and they go, they don't grow immediately. It takes several years if they're not disman dismantled by then. So all of these libertarian views are ba basically correct, but there's also the more leftist, um, and we should note that Denmark is a socialist, more leftist country in general. Um, and that's also why we have such a strong belief that, for example, cultural production is linked with greater diversity and a cultural identity. So we create you know, national identity by giving um, people the opportunity to create experiments and to create uh, and broaden the creative um, products that we have. And also one important part is that the governments are responsible for education training and the games market is a really big market and it would be a miss if the government didn't actually provide um, opportunities and um, you know, positioning so that we can strengthen that market in Denmark. Mm. I do think that <laughs> cultural uh, soft funding has a place in Denmark. 
and I think it should be in all countries, actually. Um, because, and we'll get into that later on as well. Um, actually, next slide. Because cultural support is a safe space for innovation and experimentation. And direct funding, it acts as an insulator from an otherwise competitive environment where game devs can experiment, innovate within genre, structure, and the way that business uh, models they function, and thereby stretch the foundation and the boundaries for what games can do. And besides that, subsidies, as we've talked up about before, they're rarely able to disturb the price competition because the cultural support is fairly low. Um, <coughs> cultural support also keep, often keep the money within the country because they go to Danish people making Danish games, um, or at least go to wages that are Danish. So people spend money in the, in the, the national or the, the national market. Um, and it should also be said that um, as a contrast to this like extremely positive view, um, cultural support like Spilotning in Denmark at least has had this, um, we've sometimes considered as the only type of seed funding that we have for small companies to get money even uh, from the beginning. And this has sort of been misinterpreted, misinterpreted as steering the game studios in Denmark towards being um, unsustainable. But if we look at what Spilotning actually does, they're fulfilling their um, mandate as a cultural support. It's just that because we don't have any other form of seed funding in Denmark, oftentimes people come to, to Spilotning and say, I, want, I, I would like to start a game company or a game uh, project, and they, yeah, they get steered in the cultural direction rather than a highly commercial direction. Um, so I think that it's important to keep in mind um, that Spilotning is doing their job as a cultural support fund, and it is important that we have cultural support in Denmark. Now, some regulatory challenges within the cultural support sphere is that one of them is that games are currently not within the general block exemption regulation. That's a really difficult word to say. <laughs> um, but basically this allows member states within the EU to bring certain state age schemes like Spilotning um, into place without going through the normal notification processes in Brussels. Basically, this means that we can't act quickly. Like film is part of this uh, regulation, they can go ahead and not notify Brussels, not um, you know, give all the, get, go through all of the processes, they can simply put it into place. That's also why there's a lot of film funds in Denmark, as opposed to Spilotning as the only one in Denmark. Because it takes a long time to go through um, Brussels. Besides that, we have that the, it is bound by the Minimis regulation, and if you think about it, 200,000 euros it's not a lot of money, <laughs> not in games anyway. Um, and I know that with the inflation, they have actually increased it to 300,000, but the problem still remains that this is actually not a lot of money within the game industry. So these two are the main EU regulatory challenges that we have with the cultural support. Moving on to why prototype funding is important. Um, this is not something that we have in Denmark, but I really, really hope that <laughs> we will get it soon. Um, because prototype funding is actually part of spill opening right now. You get, you get money to, to develop a prototype. Um, and this phase and this, the, the deliverable that has been, they've been obligated to fulfill the same cultural requirements as the upcoming phases afterwards. Um, the hope that we have with putting up a prototype funding um, fund is that by taking away the cultural conditions, we'll create um, prototypes that are more commercially viable. So you don't have to necessarily, um, you know, be specific to one culture or one national identity or have language requirements or that sort of thing. Um, but I would say that looking at the prototype um, funding and their conditions for other countries, 
it's not easy either. Um, often you have to have high quality concept work, proof of concept. You still have to have a full business plan. You still have to have clear USPs um, and you have to do your market research. So you have to have a really clear vision of what your game is supposed to be, how your business is supposed to be and why they should fund you for the game. So it's not like they're gonna give you money for any kind of prototype either way. Um, yeah, but right now I think that five or six European countries have it, including like Ireland and Italy and uh, UK. So it is starting to become something of a stable, I would say. Mm. And I think this is one of the opportunities that we have in Denmark to actually um, improve our, uh, what's it called, and uh, a sustainable um, environment for our games. Moving on to indirect political tools. Um, these, are, uh, these are kind of fun because tax credits is a subsidy. And I think, yeah, eight European countries are using them right now. Um, and I'm gonna walk through how tax credits work and they're really smart. <laughs> I'm very excited about tax credits. Um, but you, do, you both have cultural and, and uh, economic conditions to tax credits um, most of the time. Um, then we have incubators and accelerator programs. They're super um, common. As you can see, there's like 7,000 incubators and 8,000 accelerator programs globally. It's insane. I think in Denmark, we have Ideas Lab and we have uh, Game Hub Denmark, um, which are two incubators that you can apply to. Uh, we're gonna go through what incubator and accelerator means, um, what they're usually used uh, for. Um, and lastly, we're gonna look at complementary regulations and policies on an EU level. Um, and this is sort of where you have to think outside the game industry because there's a bunch of different policies that can affect the game industry in Denmark um, that might not be super obvious, like migration policy or how long does it take to uh, create a company, how complex is the tax system, all of these things are also reasons for why people can feel it's difficult to uh, set up a game studio or grow here in Denmark. Looking at tax credits and incentives, um, I found two different kinds of uh, tax uh, credits that we can see that UK is actually using um, payable tax credits. I didn't find a lot of examples, um, so I'm just gonna put it up there and say I don't actually understand what it is. Um, <laughs> um, but the tax relief programs is really exciting because what it does is that it lowers the um, it lowers the tax liability of a company. So instead of uh, paying, uh, if instead of having a full income and you pay tax on that, it actually lowers the liable tax that you have to pay. So it uses uh, tax as a sort of non-direct tool for supporting you. So you pay less money, basically. This is a simplified example of how tax credits work in the UK. And as you can see, you have income, 300,000. Expenditure, 150,000. So technically, without tax, uh, this like tax relief claim, um, you need to pay taxes on 150,000. In the UK, that's 19% tax. That's 28,500. That's a lot of money. However, the relief claim in the UK is up to 80% of the EEA core expenditure. That means that all the money that you spend within Europe, 80% um, of that, you can take away from your income and you can pay taxes on the rest. So 80% is 150 is 120,000. You minus that from 150 and all you need to pay taxes on net is 30,000. That's only 5,700 crowns. So in that sense, you basically lower the amount of uh, income that you need to pay taxes on. And that means that the, the state is not giving you money, but you're saving money on taxes. So that's a really, really great way to, for the government to indirectly support a, a game studio. It's a lot at five o'clock, I know, but, <laughs> but it's actually a really, it's a really good way because taxes are versatile. And uh, if you look at you know, uh, any kind of funds, like 
you know, spillordning can be drained for money. You know, you suddenly you just, there's just no more money to give out. But here, taxes, it's not like we run out of taxes or we run out of money in the state um, for not supporting uh, our game studios. So this is why I think that tax credits is a really, really important thing to look at um, when we talk about supporting our um, game studios. Um, looking at incubators and accelerators. So incubators, um, as it is mentioned in the name, it's sort of a safe environment where you can grow. Usually this means that you're provided with a space, like a venue, where you can get mentorship, you can sit together with other startups, and it's usually fairly long. It's actually six to, like six months to 24 months. So you really get to like settle down, talk to people. You usually get like accounting, like com complimentary services, legal advice. Um, and this is really important for the sort of foundation where you have uh, new companies uh, coming in. A lot of uh, incubators can be found in Sweden, for example. Um, so Sweden, I think they have like five or six incubators along the coast um, in key areas where uh, they know that the game developers are. Um, and then we have accelerators, which it lies in the name. It's when you already have established yourself, but you need funding to grow. You need uh, investors. You need to get in contact with important people um, so that you can get funding. And basically, um, you get to do that for three to six months because it's not, accelerators are not meant for you to settle down and chillax and like grow and be slow and stuff like that. It's basically where you go in, you talk to different people, you learn how to pitch, you learn how to network, you get to know where you wanna go when you uh, need funding, and then it's out. So, and recent studies have shown that entrepreneurs with a high level of education will get more out of these. So that's, I'm not sure why, but this is, uh, it's new uh, research showing that. When we talk about incubators, um, I've, I have sometimes mixed feelings about them. The good is, the good part of it is that it can really bring people together. You can network with other people. You can hear about their challenges. You can learn from each other. Um, you can also get a mentor within uh, the industry and you can, yeah, you can lend, a lot of it is also lending credibility to the company by saying, I'm part of this incubator. You can trust that I'm serious about what I'm doing. So the hidden part is that there's a lot of work going into opening new incubators because incubators are a business. They're, and they're designed and they're, um, they need to be balanced and they need to make sure that they have the right target audience. Um, so there's a lot of work going into designing an incubator. So when we talk about Sweden having a lot of incubators and we also want a lot of incubators, we need to remember that the government, a lot of stakeholders can have different agendas when it comes to incubators. Um, so it'll, it takes a long time to make sure that we really have this down uh, and that it's defined and balanced um, you know, to, to provide the services that is needed. The last thing is that there's actually some ugly stuff as well. Um, and I think that we have a certain amount of positivity bias when it comes to entrepreneurship. You know, at CBS, everybody was talking about, oh, you should make your own company, you know, that would be great. Just find a new product or adjacent to somebody else's product. It doesn't matter. Um, and I think it's not often talked about that the psychological toll of being an entrepreneur, you know, suddenly you have to work 80 hours a week or you have to spend all your life savings because you want to invest in something uh, that you think will happen. And incubators are sort of part of that um, process of being like, oh, you know, you can fail safely here and you can uh, come in here and you can stay here for six months or 24 months and then, you know, you can go out and you can just do your product. And it's just, it's not that easy. It's, I think that we really need to think critically when we talk about creating new uh, ventures. So these are sort of three different kinds of, yeah, um, aspects of incubators that I think we should 
yeah. be aware of when we talk about having new incubators in Denmark. Um, this is going to be exciting, and I'm not a politician, so <laughs> I have uh, made a very beautiful <laughs> overview of how EU <laughs> regulations work. <laughs> um, and you don't have to memorize this, it's okay. Um, but EU policies are typically decided through this like co-decision procedure where um, you have European Parliament coming up with recommendations as to what they think is important to create regulations for or create policy for. And they basically send it up to Europe, the European Commission um, and they will go through uh, an like a big assessment often taking several years where they assess, you know, potential economic, social, and env environmental impact. Um, and if the European Parliament sort of recommends something, it's not, um, it's not legislator uh, yet, it, legislation yet. It just means that they're a recommendation that they think is important. Um, and these recommendations and the assessments that they make um, has to be in uh, sort of harmony with the European Council, which is uh, an institution that sets the overall um, sort of direction for EU. And then when everything here is in order and they have perfect harmony between all of these uh, institutions, the Court of Justice of the European Union will then say, okay, well, how can we make sure that all national or all member states, they implement it in the same way. On the other side over here is actually the Danish uh, political structure where we also make our own policies, but they also have to be in accordance to, of course, the Court of Justice and they have to not clash. Um, so this is why it takes a long time because it, it just takes a long time for them to assess what uh, impact these recommendations have. It takes time for the Court of Justice to make sure that everybody interprets it in the same way and it takes time for us to also make up our own policies and make sure that they don't clash. So why does the EU poke around in the game industry? Why can't they just leave us alone? Mm. <laughs> why can't they? Um, and the reason being that the European Commission is really strict historically on consumer protection. This is why we have a harmonized uh, charger in, the, in, in Europe. Like, Apple can't go out and say like, oh, you need a special charger for the new iPhone, so too bad you don't have that. This is something that the, the EU just made up and say like, Apple can't do that. You need to only have USB-C forever now. Um, and they will go very far in protecting gamers, um, like consumers, um, while also encouraging, you know, uh, game industry growth. So for example, the ways that they do this is by addressing problematic purchase practices like loot boxes, gold farming, because this is, uh, they've done research that shows that this has a connection to money laundering, forced labor and child exploitation in uh, developing countries, for example. So obviously this is something that is not, <laughs> yeah, regulated enough. Um, there's also that we're making cancellation easier, easier because actually right now um, physical purchases have certain regulations around cancellation that games do not right now, and that's not that's not right. I mean, we have we should have cancellation policies just as well as everybody else. There's also restricting uh, manipulative game design so that we can protect uh, children better, for example. There's also a whole new market around user-created content by minors that needs to be protected. Um, and we also want to keep vulnerable, child, like, uh, vulnerable groups safe by having our games being inclusive and accessible. Um, lastly, they also care because GDPR. You know, we want to make sure that all games comply with the GDPR uh, rules. So this is just some of the, the reasons why EU um, interferes a lot in games in general. And I think that a lot of people would say that they interfere too much, but there's also 
some sense in saying like, okay, so we have all these rules, now we need to self-regulate as an industry and just become better at taking the right making the right decisions. Um, on a different note, we have game-related initiatives at an EU level which are not directly, um, they're not directly related to game production as such. We have some that are Horizon Europe, for example, which is a research program, and you know, it, the expected outcome of that is to contribute to evidence showing like the societal impact, the economic impact of games. Um, and the media chapter of Creative Europe is kind of disappointing when I found out that <laughs> they only give 1.5% of the overall budget to games. But, uh, but nonetheless, they, they're also uh, a big part of the cultural support scheme that is in Europe. Um, they're, I think their application process is 80 pages, so it's, it's a fair project to start if you wanna <laughs> start doing that. Um, and then there's an experimental uh, sort of initiative called Media Invest, which I really like, because what <laughs> it does is that it says, well, we're not gonna give money to the game developers, we're gonna give money to funds that give money to game developers, or investors who are scared of, mm, they're, they're not too willing to take risks with the game industry, but if they get money directly from Europe, they might just, yeah, take that risk anyway. So that's a really interesting way to also indirectly support the game industry. Um, we also have an accelerator, which is really exciting. Um, Spiel for Brick, um, I don't know if I say that right. Um, but besides that, we also have a couple of different uh, initiatives on the, on the right side. The Data Focus Project is actually really exciting. I, wanna, I want to recommend everybody read this, um, the understanding the value of a European video game society, um, because it just has a lot of uh, information about um, you know, analyzing the economic uh, and the employment and regulatory and cultural and societal impact of games in general. Um, and some of the future initiatives that are being discussed as well is really, um, there, there are some that are exciting, some of them are um, worrying, I would say. Um, so you have this internship grant, good for attracting talent um, to Europe, a video game observatory to sort of make sure that all the stakeholders and all of the people in games have harmonized data for when they make decisions. So that's also a really good way to, you know, do archival and do, uh, his, you know, in general, just have all the information harmonized. Um, the European Video Game Academy is an initiative to promote video games that are showcasing European values, which rang a bell and I was like, what is European video games? <laughs> I don't know, like who decides that? Who decides what is European video games? They had an uh, example where like Assassin's Creed was showing like Itali Italian architecture and I was like, what? Okay, but fine. <laughs> um, so there's like some, there's some uh, difficulties in figuring out, okay, so who decides what makes a European video game European as such? Are there even, um, you know, are, is Assassin's Creed European when it's produced in Canada? You know, all of these questions need to be uh, <laughs> asked, of course. Um, I would also say one of the, the things that I'm um, interested in knowing the future of is the Creative Europe uh, applications because I think at this point in time with ChatGPT being such a prevalent um, tool, I could imagine a future where we use ChatGPT to write our applications and Creative Europe uses AI to read them. <laughs> It'll be a nice uh, AI conversation between the two. <laughs> so I think that you know, sooner or later they'll have to figure out what they wanna do with this uh, 80 page application process. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, this is actually um, sort of an overview of some of the issues that we um, sort of have when we when we talk about non-game related policies. So for example, is it easy to move to Denmark? Uh, not particularly, as far as I've heard. Is it easy to start a business? Also not. <laughs> um, but uh, these are some of the, the problems that we have that can um, 
bring about this, uh, these results. So if we make it easier to move to a country, we will get more international talent. If we make it easier to start a business, we have lower barriers to entry. All of these things are basically policies and regulations that can come, um, that can also benefit all other industries really. But in particular, um, the game industry, we, can, uh, we should have these thoughts and these reflections when we talk about non-game uh, non policies. <coughs> One of the things that, uh, like these are, almost all of them are taken from Neo Games in Finland. They did a, a, a big uh, policy recommendation um, in 2009 for, to support a long-term strategy. Um, and I think that this is something that we should also do for Denmark. We should go say, okay, so this is not even games related. Like we just want better, you know, we want to understand your tax system better. Can you make it easier to understand your tax system? Or can you make it easier for our children to, if we move to Denmark, can you, you know, make sure they go to school? And can we make sure that they also learn how to code? You know, that sort of thing um, will not only help the game industry, it will also help everybody else really. Um, yep, so I wanna, I wanna bring up two national cases that I found really interesting. Um, usually when you think about Holland, you don't think about their massive game industry. Um, but actually, they have a massive game industry. They just have it uh, within edu games. Um, so they make edu games for hospitals, military, uh, yeah, all kinds of government institutions, really. And the government early on saw the potential in this. And they started pouring money into their budget for this. And because of the interest, the early interest, they also started having educations that are specific, you know, specifically for making sure that we have game developers who are educated. And as you can see, in 2012, we had 20 colleges and universities that offered game-related education and courses. This is for a small country, almost the same size as Denmark. And um, it's really interesting to just see how their story sort of came about from a an entirely different perspective than what ours did. Like, you know, in, I think in many, in many countries, games are seen as something as entertainment, it's something for kids, it's you know, something that you do for fun or for escapism. But Holland went around and saw it as a major opportunity to educate their military, their hospitals, their schools, you know, everything, all sort of levels of society could uh, benefit from games. And they also enjoy a really well um, organized subsidy language or a, a landscape. Um, their website is incredibly easy to use and you can just find the information that you need really, really fast. <laughs> um, and they have this sort of um, almost research based um, or academic look at how they see the, the landscape. So you have industry, like the developers, creative, creative and publishers, and the next level is education and research. You have enablers, channels, and beneficiaries. So they have a really sort of well-organized structure on how to understand games and what games can do for Holland. So that's a really, I, th I never thought about this, but Holland is really well, um, yeah, really well uh, educated and really successful um, industry. The next industry is a bit of a new one, so it's uh, Poland, and um, Poland is sort of, they grew a lot as an outsourcing service um, within PC and mobile, and they're experiencing a lot of the same growing pains as any new industry would. Um, lack of talent uh, within programming, the universities are not equipped to sort of handle the interest right now. Um, and I would say like 2018, they had 160 uh, companies and like, I don't, and today it's 494 companies and they, ha they employ like 15,000 people. It's extremely uh, high growth in Poland right now. And they also have one of the highest uh, percentages of women working in the industry, which is 24%. So that's a really, um, it's a really big uh, industry in Poland. Um, they also, are an example of the importance of having um, like well-established migration policies because they in they experienced throughout the last since since 2016 
a large influx of immigrants from, among other, Ukraine, Lugansk, um, uh, what was the word? But anyway, um, but they have a lot of people coming in who are educated in games and they um, made sure that they could really quickly get into the gaming industry in Poland. So one of the things that Poland also has is that they have a really strong uh, political recognition as well that's enjoyed it for a long time, both within innovation and education and, uh, and culture. They have like, yeah, they have tax credits, cultural grants, grants and loans for the establishment of specifically game dev SMEs. And they have support for game jams, major trade events. Like they have, they, they have really brought everything down to having a holistic view of the game industry, um, of the ecosystem. And they also focus a lot on the commercialization of games. So they make very, <laughs> at least what I, what I could read, they make horror, they make simulation, and they make uh, retro shooters and city builders. And that's highest grossing uh, genres <laughs> on Steam. Like they just like went for it. <laughs> These are the genres that make money, we're gonna make those. Um, so there's a, yeah, there's a lot of, uh, of good things about Poland. Of course, there's also, common challenges and, and aspects, which is like, oh, CD Projekt Red is a major part of the employee and the, the, the revenue as well. There's a lot of new you know, companies being um, funded or founded and dismantled within a year. You know, there is uh, crunch and poor labor conditions and all that sort of stuff as well. But nonetheless, I think it's an important, um, or I think it's an interesting case to, to look at, especially because they've been growing so big within a very few years. And uh, what we can learn from that, basically. Um, finally, I wanna, just to wrap sort of direct and indirect financial support up, there is uh, a thought that it, I had, which was like screening versus automatic processes when it comes to applying for, um, for grants. Usually cultural grants, <coughs> are applied for. There's a screening process, it takes a long time, you have to fulfill all these conditions. With automatic processes, it would be, it would be good to set up some of the grants as automatic processes where you, if you, you know, if you fulfill these uh, conditions, you will automatically get the grant instead of having a screening first. Um, so if we could get more automatic processes as a contrast to, uh, these application processes that would ease the way that companies have to plan and use uh, a lot of time to apply for funding. Um, and then I also talked about direct versus indirect support in terms of like the strongest arguments for indirect funding is that, um, and it's through tax credits, is that taxes are really versatile. So you don't run dry. Grants run dry, tax does not. So tax credits basically have like less interference in the marketplace and they, yeah, they don't run dry. But um, there is also, there are also like arguments for why tax credits are really like to some extent kind of bad. Like in Canada, they have a big tax relief program and uh, Ubisoft of course has a, has a big department over there and um, they basically, uprooted an entire department or entire, their entire company and just moved it to another state because they were just, uh, the, the other state had better tax credits there. So it becomes sort of a zero sum game where everybody's like, oh, I have better tax here. I have better tax credits here. And people just get moved around like chess pieces. Um, so there is like, but there are, there are uh, arguments for why this is, this could be implemented in a good way. And Denmark is a small country, so it's not like they're gonna move to Yulan and <laughs> just go there, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, I come from Yulan, I can say it. Um, <laughs> so it's all connected, you know, um, the funding, the way we fund uh, companies, the way we make them apply for funding, the way we give them money. Um, and I think it's just, uh, you know, once you get into it and once you see, okay, tax credits could be really fun, prototype funding could be really fun. I think it would be the next steps for Denmark to have these um, two types of uh, funding at least. So 
This is uh, the end of the first part. The other parts are not as long, I promise. Um, but now we're gonna look at, uh, have a quick look at the history of Game Initiative. Mm. And Jesper Christensen was really uh, nice to give uh, me this diagram, which he had already made, um, where you can actually see what has happened throughout the last 25 years. And it's divided into financing, organization, and education. And as you can see, ICU is the longest standing um, education, providing game um, education. And then we have DaddyU, the Adenia Games, and the producer education. So those are the four sort of major um, educational institutions that we have within games. Um, in the organization, there has been a lot of different sort of initiatives that some of them sort of uh, ended because it's a lot of these are government backed. So that means when the government switches or we get a new party, everything is really, you know, revised and some of these um, programs are shut down. Um, and in 2025, we have these uh, Spin Institute and DK Game, which are the new um, exciting association and uh, way of organizing ourselves. Um, Historically, we've been um, categorized within the Film Institute, and maybe this will be the year where we actually get our own institute. As well as uh, present training, who usually would take care of, uh, or have the oversight of the games, as well as film and uh, advertisement, um, will be a separate association, um, not necessarily called DK Game, but something else as well. Um, so this is a brief uh, sort of, uh, yeah, history of that. And financing, uh, finally, we have uh, three major ways of, of not, well, Copenhagen Matchup is actually not a direct funding um, opportunity, but we do have uh, Creative Europe and Spielordning, and that's a little bit uh, thin, I would say, maybe. <laughs> um, but Copenhagen Matchup provides a lot of uh, good opportunities to find external funding. Um, yeah, so... That was a big, quick overview. Um, this is one of the models that I presented in my master thesis back in, um, in 2021. I would say some of the information, like Ideas Lab, uh, is missing, so it's a little bit out of date, but it still um, illustrates the challenge that we have here in Denmark uh, fairly well. As you can see on the left side, we have, uh, from small to large, um, the content of the, of the triangle sort of um, relates to what kind of events or initiatives would you like to see. So when you're small, you want to attract talent, you want to you know, have a community, you want to have networks. Um, as you grow uh, bigger, you want to have CVRs, you want to have figure out how to create your company, um, you want to make sure that you have a proof of concept. And in the, in the last uh, part of the top part there, we have mentoring, investment, and growth. And some of the things that, uh, the initiatives that are currently here is like, oh, you have Match Co Copenhagen, you have Game Hub Denmark. Um, for the top part, you have Growing Games, Road to Funding, and some startup programs. And then you have Spilpa um, at the bottom. So there are events and initiatives for these different phases. But for example, something like Solid, um, which was a program for, um, it was basically like learning how to pitch. It was like an accelerator program um, that uh, Vision Denmark had. Was closed down, unfortunately, to, yeah. And which is really sad because it was actually one of the ones that um, made a lot of sense uh, to the Danish game industry. On the right, or the right side here, we have funding um, initiatives and we go from sort of low to high amount of support. And what we have here is, is an entirely small, uh, empty part of the triangle, which is seed funding. We don't have any seed funding in Denmark. Um, what we have in the middle is DFI, which is only cultural, Innovationsfonden, which is only uh, tech. Um, and then we have Status Kunstfund to some extent, uh, which has just opened up to games. And, but that's only individuals, and it has a very high sort of artistic uh, condition. Um, lastly, we have two big investors, uh, which is Eiffel and Nordic Games. Um, but they don't, you know, they don't invest in small companies. They, you, this is growth that they're looking for, basically. So as you can see, we are missing 
financial support and, and business mentoring for game companies in general. Looking at Finland, Sweden, and Norway, uh, why do we even look at them? I don't know either. No, um, but several academic uh, articles have actually been written about uh, the game industries in Finland, Sweden, and Norway. And a lot of it is mapping out the origins of their game industries through demo scene, through um, access to technology, and through their different, um, yeah, their different, in, you know, initiatives within t uh, how they organize themselves. And I think that the fact that they're looking inwards and they're studying their own history, their own origins, it enables them to look forward in, a, in an entirely new way. And we haven't really done that in Denmark very much. Um, we haven't really looked at our, 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 our industry the last 25 years and thought, okay, so these policies were implemented here and we saw that growth and this happened, you know, but why? Well, how are these all connected? And I think that merging their research, ac academic research with their commercial activity to un understand their own history has really, yeah, it's, it, they are informing about their own um, in industry, but also teaching themselves about how to sustain it. Um, and lastly, it also shows like, it shows them how other people look at them. It impacts how other people look at them. So if they have a lot of research and they say like, oh, look at how successful we are. We're like, look at all these compares comparative studies that we've made and look at all the demo scene activity that we've had. Denmark looks at them and be like, oh shit, I, we, we, we want to be part of that cool club as well. Um, so we're gonna show what we got here of similarities and differences. So similarities, we are all small open democracies, um, usually small domestic markets. We're not like huge exporters of products. Um, we are welfare state policies, so we're tax-based. We've got wage synchronization, which is like um, how responsive our wages are to the labor demand. So it's not like our wages go like wildly up and down according to how much uh, labor demand there is. Um, we have either state intervention or neoliberalist influences. So except Sweden, basically, like the government tends to ha play a strong role in how industries are formed. Uh, we are neoliberalist in the sense that there are some pull towards um, uh, the individual taking more responsibility for their own uncertainty and their own successes. Um, also, not in Sweden, political incentives towards the media and cultural sphere. I don't think that Sweden has taken a lot of interest in supporting cultural or creative industries up until now. I think that now they're starting to like think about how they, uh, they wanna uh, support them. Um, in all of, in Finland and Sweden particularly, there was a lot of demo scene activity. Um, people just getting together, uh, coding a lot, um, hacking games, learning how to, yeah, uh, develop games, and uh, harmonization with EU except Norway. So differences historically has been that Finland and uh, Sweden has been really strong information technology sectors. So they had, from a really early start, they had TIKIS, which was this inno like governmental innovation um, institution that just poured money into telephones and infrastructure to make sure that uh, Finland was in front of everything. Um, and Sweden, of course, also uh, was somewhat like that with, uh, with Nokia. So there is sort of a power couple of resources. And I think that Sweden and Finland were better at seeing opportunities when they arose. So they had this quicker utilization of non-proprietary system. You know, they had, you know, they had their telephone uh, industries and they saw this is a way to distribute games. You know, and they saw that really early on. So Sweden and Finland has had more sort of neoliberalist approaches, focusing a lot on 
innovation, focusing a lot on making sure that their businesses were solidly founded so that people learned about how to do good business. Um, and I think Norway had a more protectionist approach because they, <laughs> they have, uh, kind of like Denmark, they have their, their game industries is folded into NFI, the, the Norwegian Film Institute, but they do give a lot of money. They give like I don't know, 45 million a year. It's a lot of money because they're rich. Um, but they have a more protectionist uh, approach because what they say is that, okay, so games need to be Norwegian. You need to have Norwegian language, you need to have Norwegian culture, you need to have Norwegian history, you know, otherwise you won't get a dime. So they are very sort of like protected, uh, protective towards their own, um, to towards their own game industry. Um, and yeah, I also think that, that uh, Norway is, is similar to Denmark in the sense that their industry is also sparsely mapped. Like they don't have a clear sort of institute, they don't have a clear history. They're a little bit more like us in, uh, in a sense. Um, so short um, overview of what I think is the most um, important part of uh, differences uh, between the Nordics. Um, I do have a side thought about the importance of harmonized documentation and historical uh, archivation. Um, and I think that that's what we're actually missing in Denmark a lot. We're missing this sort of overview of the last 40 years. You know, what have we done? What are the games that we've done? What are the companies that ex existed? Um, because I think that that could be a foundation for us to go out and say, oh, now we can actually do deep dives. We can, we can um, compare ourselves to neighbors better. We can figure out what they've done. How can we share histories? And I also think that it would help to have political initiatives in a context where we would be able to understand what was the consequences of this, this initiative. Like, can we do better? What can we do next time that will make it even, uh, that would be even more beneficial? And generally learning from our history. Um, this is also another diagram from my thesis um, where I sort of outline, okay, so the video game industry consists of culture, technology, and education, and government policy can sort of influence all of these uh, areas individually. This is not to say that I think that the government should be, should interfere in all uh, decisions that are made within video game, but I do think that it can create a really good foundation um, for us to grow and to create a more sustainable industry in general. Um, and I think that we don't share the same history as our neighbors, but I think that we can get inspired by them, we can see what they've done, we can figure out what our own national identity as game creators are and is, and we can make sure that we do better every year. And we can look back and say, okay, we did this, Let's try something different. Um, yeah, so I think that that's a, that's a really good holistic view of, of uh, how we should think about games in general. Uh, I can see that the keynote format is messing up with my font. <laughs> this is not, is not an artistic way of saying <laughs> setting it up. Um, but just a little bit more about um, you know, the political landscape that we've had in Denmark around games. Um, early 2000 was a really exciting time where we've sort of figured out, oh, you know, there's this like cultural and creative industries and they're exciting because they act differently than other industries and like they don't behave or, or cater to the same, yeah, um, norms. And I think that, you know, as soon as we figured that out, mid 2000s, uh, Denmark sort of established these zones where they're like, oh, we're gonna, we're gonna explore games and gastronomy and design and art as separate sort of entities within uh, the cultural industries. And then after 2012, uh, we started looking at more creative hubs or creative clusters. The new theory sort of came that if we you know, cluster all these industries, maybe they can create new connections between them, maybe they can uh, learn from each other. And so Computer Space Zone was, uh, became 
Interactive Denmark, and now it has become Vision Denmark, which is like an industry cluster for animation, XR, VR, um, games, and film. So the purpose of this is to make sure that if we cluster them, then they, we can learn from each other. And I think that to some extent this is really good, but there should also be, because games are, are like a mixture of a lot of different creative industries, I think to some extent that we should have specific lobby organizations to make sure that people understand what we actually do. Um, so I think that that's a really important part and a very few specific organizations have actually done this over the last couple of years, but this might change with uh, present training letting go of their oversight of the ga of games uh, and actually giving it over to a new yet unnamed um, association. It's also important to note that the game industry is in the context of neoliberalism and this is sort of abstract, but neoliberalism in general means sort of the, uh, that you are responsible for your own uh, success, uh, you're responsible for your own health, you have increased um, uncertainty and risk placed on you as a person, rather than the government coming in and alleviating some of these uh, issues, basically. And so the neoliberalist tendencies is to sort of to sort of um, remove government interference. So we have these uh, welfare policies. Oh, we can't have welfare policies. We, you know, people should be paying for their own uh, benefits. Um, and creative policies in a government context are sort of driven by desire for the government to show, oh, we're successful in these, in these industries and thereby also pushing towards uh, a sort of dismantling of the government support system. So we say, okay, so the government shouldn't, um, should support them, but they should eventually become, you know, an industry of their own to, uh, to have their own risks. And there's also the second part of it, which is the labor conditions within creative industries has long known to be precarious. You know, you have crunch, you have long hours, you have, um, you know, uh, what's it called? Sexual harassment, all of these things are prevalent in creative industries. And I think that what Niborg and Deklo uh, says, the rise of creative industries may thus help to discipline a new generation into a new liberal mode of working and a docile population. So if we don't become aware that the government also has their own agenda, then we can't, um, we can't fight against it. And we can't continue to do research in the way that we want to. We can't continue to make games under conditions that we allow ourselves to. So I just wanted to have this as a side note. It's a little bit more academic and a little more abstract, but it's really important to grasp that everybody has their agendas and we need to push against those. So wrapping up. Um, this is basically my uh, take on how we can make sure that we have a holistic ecosystem um, for the Danish industry. And it's basically just like a, a mixture of all of the things that we've talked about today. We need a stronger theoretical, economic, and political map. So understanding where we've been, why, where we want to go. Um, a long-term strategy for funding and supporting all stages of a game company. So we have prototype uh, funding, seed funding, and growth funding, um, complementary policies and initiatives like the ones that Neo Games in Finland actually provided. So how can we make sure that all aspects that are non-game related also become easier for people? Stronger public-private partnerships um, between you know, institutions and government and the industry itself. And I also want to say that like, I want to have a documentation and national archive of the Danish game industry. It's, it's so important. I think that we can't only have one person in the Danish like, Royal Library collecting games. We need to have a stronger, um, a stronger foundation for the decisions that we are going to make over the next couple of years. And uh, that's it. Thanks for listening.